and visual interactive aids for mathematical researchers. And um, so I sent this abstract before. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different things that are all kind of interrelated. Um, and let's see, the outline is something like this. So I'll have part zero, which is an overview of the why. And part one is uh, kinesthetic and visual cognitive aids, specifically in probability and statistics. How do we communicate Kolmogorov's little omega and measurable spaces and all of this to like first year students in data science, right? Uh, part two, I will start uh, talking a bit about measurable experiments and mathematical art. So this is a measurable double pendulum with optical encoders. We can get into that. And then part three is sage math for theorems and live data in the course Benny and I are actually teaching right now for the introduction to data science. So the high level overview of the why, why use kinesthetic and visual interactive aids for mathematical communications, in lectures, tutorials, problem sessions, and recitations. So um, this is sort of a cut to something I was doing in New Zealand. So I just slightly edited the slides. And what I'm trying to show here is mainly uh, what we did in New Zealand for uh, engineering mathematics uh, and honors level mathematics. Uh, so basically the idea is you see more, feel more, do more. So it's uh, all about augmenting communications and mathematics lectures and tutorial with visual, tactile and kinesthetic learning aids beyond just the, uh, what I think is very important, blackboard or whiteboard scribing style, right? So this is complementing those things. Um, so this is Galileo Galilei. Um, so in order to understand the universe, you must know the language in which it is written and that language is mathematics. That's his quote. <laughs> I don't totally buy it, but there is some value in it in the sense that a lot of the models that we use to launch rockets or do AI have uh, mathematics under the hood to, to uh, make predictive and precise models. So in that sense, uh, Mathematics is very used uh, to take decisions in the real world. So the goal in the classroom as well, we, we need our students to understand concepts clearly, not just follow formulae recipes, right? Well, at least if 5% understand it deeply, I'm happy, especially in a large engineering class, because that's the innovation side of things. So it's, um, yeah, but also we don't want to bore the 95%. <laughs> So it's a kind of a compromise problem. So this is the reality in the classroom, <laughs> some cartoon. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can all relate to this. So what we, what we have is basically, uh, sorry about this overlay problem. We, we have a limited time to cover a comprehensive syllabus to a large number of students. Mathematics, mathematics is a difficult language. You know, it's a language that's learned by, by doing and uh, we have limited time and uh, the syllabus is usually quite large, especially in service courses. So we may need to communicate beyond traditional read-write methods for the so-called post-YouTube generation uh, by using um, you know, visual, tactile, and kinesthetic strategies. And these are some simple examples. You, know, you have a hyperbolic paraboloid. We have some of the toys in our lounge in the other house here. Um, so you can sort of see um, what it is. So what I mean is 3D print it and feel it. <laughs> See it, feel it, right? So, um, so you know, the idea is that in a sort of tutorial system or what we call problem sessions, uh, the idea is to take some of these, and pass them around when students are solving problems, right? So what if students could feel, see, and do more with the aid of these custom 3D printed uh, aids? This is just for calculus, for multivariate calculus, right? So 3D printers are very convenient. You can simply uh, print what you want. You can also order these. These things come from a particular uh, company actually that sells these things. Um, and you can have, you know, basically you go from the mathematical concept to a computer model. So you can familiar with mathematical or sage math. You can simply write these uh, frames and then you can simply go to a SDL file for 3D printing. So it's really kind of just like, for example, here's 12 lines of Mathematica code. 
that goes to, so this should be SDL file for printing. Right? And uh, so anything you can, you can mathematically describe, you can just print, okay? Um, okay. So uh, we can also order this uh, in mass. It depends on costs, right? So it may take more time to go to the Ongstrom visualization lab downstairs where you can get uh, little wrenches if you pass exams and then you will be allowed to print for free basically downstairs, right? I had my daughters go through a couple of the wrenches. Like they didn't have the gas to go through enough to print, but you know, it's, it's, it's doable. But it of course takes time, so it may be just cheaper to buy this. So this is the kind of thing in a problem session, you may have a large one for the instructor doing the demo or the tutor, um, the manuals. And then you can give these little, uh, little ones to, to the students and they can kind of play with stuff, right? Um, of course, the problems have to be thought about very carefully and not just cooked up, but then it could be nice. Um, yeah, so um, standard things in calculus could be 2D and 3D integration, volume separation, line and quantum integrals, polar spherical coordinates, transformation of random vectors, tangent planes, and so on. And there are many ways to do this. So there are online services you could go to. So if the average tutorial, uh, say has six problems, three parallel sessions, we need roughly 18 of these and it costs uh, under a uh, hundred US dollars to, to shop around. So that's, that, that is not too much. And then you can kind of throw them after a couple of years or recycle them actually. Um, so the feasibility is to use the printer outside Armstrong library here if people are interested, and then simply uh, we can even recycle the materials through the, through the system because it's recyclable. And of course, we can do more fun things like this is the uh, tractor, the Lorenz tractor uh, that Warwick showed exists. Part of the reason I'm here because he was at Cornell on a postdoc and was kind of famous for a few months. So uh, anyway, and then you can do other more interesting things as well. Uh, of course, we can measure the efficiency of this if you really want efficiency of this. So if you want to really introduce this into a tutorial, you can sort of see if students like it, get some feedback and see if it's really useful. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, I think it'll be possibly a good idea, at least for certain kinds of students, to have these uh, kinesthetic and uh, you know, sort of learning aids to complement the uh, pen and paper blackboard style learning. So here is uh, some references. So that's the end of part one. That's kind of motivating why. And okay, good. We're on time. So part zero uh, is done. So part one is now a bit more into, let's look at a slightly more complicated thing rather than just integration and rotation, which is beautiful. But we want to try to enable students to concretely understand, say, call Magorov's axiomatic language of probability theory, right? And then suing statistical experiments. So this is kind of one of our missions for the <laughs> Intro to Data Science course. Uh, we have students from a very variety of backgrounds. We have students from mathematics who are very good, who fix the typos <laughs> in our notes. <laughs> and it's good. Uh, and then we mix them in group assignments with everyone else. We have students completely from foreign countries who have had very different backgrounds but we have our own IT students who have never proved anything, right? So we have to initiate them for proofs as well. But I, I you know, at least in the sort of second cut, uh, we're trying to, um, you know, enable them a bit more about understanding uh, things in a, some uh, concrete way, not just with the pen and paper. So that means the mathematical communication, even for the simplest, uh, you know, statistical experiments. Uh, is, or is an order of magnitude more subtle, like what is really meant by, you know, measurable uh, maps uh, for a particular experiment. So here we would like to use both physical objects as well as computers in complementary ways. Computers are a lot easier. Physical objects, you know, it involves uh, <coughs> taking things, something like this to classrooms. So what I thought we could do next is maybe dive into Galton's Quint chunks and its extension known as the Sep chunks. So I'll present this uh, brief paper we wrote a couple of years ago, and then I'll let Eric join in to present his prototype of the Sep chunks. Okay. 
So let's see, maybe I should make this a bit bigger. So this is, um, this is this paper, extending Galton's binomial quin chunks to the binomial sep, sep chunks. Galton is a, how many of you know of Sir Francis Galton? Yeah, he's quite a, quite a character. Uh, so he's related to, you know, all the, all the intelligent British people are sort of kind of related by a couple of degrees of cousinhood. So he's related to Darwin. Uh, he's also the founder of the eugenics laboratory in UCL. So, you know, he had various theories about uh, um, human populations and so on at the time, like most people, but he developed some very uh, interesting ways of actually uh, talking about observable phenomena, right? This is a very British empirical school, the traditional block, Barclay and Hume. And um, so here he has this thing, I just have a quote from his book, uh, this one called Natural Inheritance um, from 1889. It's the mechanical illustration of the cause of the curve of frequency, is what he calls it. And um, this is a schema of this. Um, so you kind of have to imagine it's like a big glass uh, a jar basically. And then uh, you can tilt it. So if you tilt it uh, upside down, all these little lead shots, these are actually from <laughs> little shots. They will all go back to these tubes and through the nails and collect there and then you can invert it. And then it simply comes from the top through the funnel. So there is a, uh, you know, a lot of nonlinearity to the initial condition of each ball that's rolling down the funnel and it'll hit the first nail down there. And then it'll go left and right with roughly equal probability, assuming it's sort of straight, you know? And then it'll sort of trickle down and collect in these buckets. So this is sort of the binomial experiment. You can model it as a sum of Bernoulli's where the Bernoulli random vectors are zero comma one and one comma zero and you do sort of vector addition. And then the combinatorics comes down. So that's, uh, and then he kind of is you know, sort of fascinated with this Gaussian law, right? So it's, uh, yeah, he, yeah he, he's done, this book is quite interesting. So he actually has physical ways of simulating from uh, Gaussian distribution using sort of discrete inverse transforms by rolling these three weird dice. I have a model of them actually outside my then he also has prescription on how to look at it from the edge of your eye and all the crazy details. But yeah, he's a, it's, it's an interesting work, right? So we simply you know, present this, uh, it was mostly for uh, uh, lecturers in statistics, this, uh, this uh, Berkeley journal. And um, then we coded this using, uh, at that time, MATLAB. It would be really nice to do with this animation that was shown two uh, seminars ago in the Common Politics and Probability seminar where you can do these by movies in SageMap. But this was done in MATLAB. So you simply have these balls go down and then they sort of collect. And then this thing, these needles are just counting the number of balls that landed in each of these uh, lattice points. Right? So 10 samples, this is the empirical distribution. And this black asterisk is what you would expect under the binomial law. And then as samples increase, you see these, these empirical relative frequencies are converging to this. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the main idea. And what we did is, okay, if you want to extend this to three dimensions, then you have this random vector called the de Moivre random vector, which is just say in three dimensions, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0. You do vector additions in 3D, and then you get trinomial samples. So um, that's essentially, you know, it's a trinomial, more generally multinomial. So now how do you understand multinomials? Well, it's the same idea. We did some animations in MATLAB. These are controlled animations. Students can set the parameters for how many steps, how many simulations and so on. And then we sort of introduce the simplex and two simplex and so on. Okay, so this is uh, essentially the visual cognitive tool. So we, uh, in the last part of the talk, I'll show what Benny and I are doing with SageMath now. Um, but um, so then, of course, this is not enough. Uh, a lot of the students will sort of, I mean, really clever ones. This is what I sort of broke my heart. <laughs> it's extremely clever kids. They just like, what is binomial? I don't get it, right? 
But then we started, uh, so we built this, uh, actually one of the students, Brian Lawrence built it as part of his project for the course. Uh, and then, um, so you drop this big truck ball bearing um, and then it just hits the nails and then it collects and, you know, so, and then we sort of, yeah, wrote it. So then we even had like little students started playing tournaments, um, like who can actually get the ball to a, to a pre-called bucket. I mean, some of these kids are amazing. Like they would get like, I don't know, seven out of 10 in the same bucket. Don't, don't ask me how. Um, and then this is a three-dimensional version, right? So this is called the sep chunk. So Galton himself didn't talk about the sep chunks, but it's just natural generalization where you have a tube. And then you have tetrahedral junctions. So it's just mimicking the, the lattice, the, what chemists believe is the carbon atom structure in diamond. And then you have this sort of set chunk. So now the ball technically can fall through and then go through those three things, come down and so on. So that's the, so and then when, you, when they assemble this, you know, in, in the tutorial, they really understand binomial and trinomial and they can see how the combinatorics works, right? And conventionally uh, this, open board or whatever, there would be such a thing in the permanent exhibition that this to be refurbished completely the one is uh, oh wow that's cool so, so that'll be like a bean machine board. yeah cool cool yes. no that's uh that's that's good so anyway i don't want to okay so this is uh done so next i think we will have eric present his prototype of the sep chunks i hope the volume will be loud uh enough is it loud enough yeah, it seems okay. So I have to stop uh, my share, right? Yes. Um. So then we can turn that into a three-dimensional one. Uh, my name is Eric and a few years ago I got into 3D printing with FDM printers. Uh, after a while the focus started to become improving printers, testing new things, and I got another printer and it went from there. Then I heard about this. So we can consider the marbles, uh, they are still bearings that go into tubes and are then capped at the end. For uh, Galton's uh, queen queens, uh, can be built using two dimensional nodes connected by pipes. This was an initial version just to see if it is practical and before starting to do work to turn this into a three-dimensional structure for the, or windows. Uh, after a while of structure, uh, designing that, uh, the first iteration was done and it, it was modified slightly through different iterations so it can easily be used and fit with small tubes. It is printed in semi-transparent material to allow for each zero site. And then we can have a proper construction of it. And then we can go to the demonstration of this. So we have small bearings and the structure. If I pour them into the funnel, they will slowly move. This is the funnel slightly stuck. We can see that they slowly move into the different paths.
I guess, are there more in the middle? Uh, we can see that towards the middle of it, there are more than at the ends. It appears that one junction at the edge is a bit static. And thus, there are fewer in the center, the bottom layer. So you see here, they are more towards the middle and towards the ends. For some reason, the center is a bit stuck towards the top. Yeah, also, I guess you need the longer columns to collect more balls. It seems like it's getting stuck. <clears throat> yes. However, if we keep having short columns here, we can see from what direction they meet towards the end. So from what path they come from. So how much roughly did it cost you to uh, print this? Like, what is the material cost? Roughly? The material cost is not that high, but then you also need to factor in the approximate running cost from the printer, which is still not that much compared to the ball bearings. So well under 100 kroners for the material cost for the Say if I want to buy this and uh, you know just have it for a course, because uh, the nice thing about this, for example, is it could be mounted on a platform and then we could put water levels on each side. And if the platform is tiltable, because you can get one of these platforms for like 800 crowns for these sort of fancy laptop stations, then what, what I would love to do with this uh, is to show students uh, Bayesian inference, because you can look in the water level. So if you tilt it, or two degrees of freedom, right? You can actually say, okay, what is your prior belief that the ball will go this way versus that way? And of course, you know, if it's perfectly even with the water levels, you'll say, okay, it's one third, one third, one third is my prior belief. And then they can put the stuff and then do the experiment count and then actually estimate the parameter, right? So it'll be a super concrete way of seeing sort of Bayesian experiments. And this is actually a Dirichlet um, prior right of course if you know this Sylvain isn't here otherwise she'll be, she's in Germany I think so uh I think in that sense it could be very very useful so so roughly what is what what is the cost say I want to buy this or the math department wants to buy this uh Eric what would you say it costs um, due to the time it uh, takes to print and the time to model it uh, approximately 1000 kroners Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's good. With models included. Okay. Wow. Okay. Good. For this size, if it is desired, uh, it can be made larger. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, please stay around for questions later. Because uh, Eric, uh, I have some other plans with Eric because he's very quick with printing. So uh, later on in the last part of the talk, I'll show you that there's other things we could do, like the chaotic water wheel or you know, more interesting things. Okay, so I'm gonna share screen now and continue. Um, okay, so. So that's the end of part one. So part two is about uh, uh, a measurable double pendulum uh, and in general, other measurable experiments. Uh, once again, we want this to be somewhat smallish. Um, if you want to take it to a, a lecture or a problem session. Uh, but at the same time, we can also have other installations that are more like sort of art. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to that. Um, this means, you know, mounting something on, on one of the 
hallways or something like this. So students can come and play, the, the data can be just sort of streaming somewhere, they can download or whatever. Um, so this is uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, mechatronically measurable double pendulum. Um, this one is particularly interesting. Um, in fact, um, this is something Warwick uh, was involved in sort of, so it has, uh, so for example, there's a mercury switch here and I can connect this. I, I'm, I, I'm not gonna do this, it's Python 2, I didn't dockerize it, so it, it, it works. So I can connect it like this and then through this board, uh, I can connect it to a um, uh, USB, right? So then I can collect the data that comes from the two arms so this is um, the first arm. So you see there's an optical encoder here. Uh, it and then there's another optical encoder here. Right? So what it does is, um, I really scared when I do this. Um, so yeah, it's just a double pendulum. So you can completely get, collect the data uh, from where you released it, right? So when you release it gently, it's uh, with enough energy you know that the um, you know, velocity is zero and you start with the position and then you do just immediate uh, finite differences to get the velocity. And then uh, that's all you need, right? Two positions and two velocities. And the optical encoders are uh, quite uh, precise. So we built this as a sort of counter example for a machine interval experiments. So the, the, the measurement space itself can be intervals because you actually, the optical encoder has these, these holes, um, right? It's like a disc. Um, and then it has these tiny slits so if you sort of break open one of these. And then there are essentially, a, you know, 2048 <clears throat> such ones. That's the resolution of these two. So then, uh, you know, there's a laser shining on one side and then the set on the other side. So you actually only know the position up to some interval, right? So you can actually do very specific enclosures of the positions and then do very simple interval arithmetic to get enclosures of the, of the, of the velocities. Uh, and then you can even do like time algebras. <laughs> it's time if you really go far enough, right? It, it's uh, this, the quartz crystal drifts. So let's not go there this is it's, it's fine to just keep it at the unit of milliseconds for example um so what i wanted to show you maybe is uh, a tiny bit of uh, um, this report um not too much so this is sort of a i did sort of completed this during one of my sabbaticals at the indian statistical institute in bangalore maybe my one of my most favorite places maybe besides siberia to do mathematics <laughs> because uh, in Bangalore, uh, it's kind of in a jungle uh, and there are cobras that are alive that live there. So if you kind of go a bit intense, you can go and calm down <laughs> around the cobra. So you, you really have to walk very carefully. So I really like it. So anyway, this is, um, this is the, the double pendulum. And uh, what we did was, you know, there's quite a lot of work. So we had a bunch of students and uh, engineers working. Everything was done from scratch, uh, including, you know, subcontracts with Chinese uh, circuit design manufacturers, the, you know, the, the uh, everything, right? So these things were cut in, uh, in, 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 in lates in the engineering department, civil engineering department at uh, Canterbury in New Zealand. And, you know, it has, uh, yeah, so full blown details. So this is kind of how the, the, so here we have looking at arm one and arm two's positions only through time and then the two trajectories are because uh, this is Pierce Lawrence uh, releasing the, the double pendulum from the same initial condition up to what's measurable, even up to interval enclosures. So that means, you know, he's releasing it exactly at the same position. Of course, the trajectories diverge because the so-called finite Lyapunov exponent is quite large with that much energy in the system. So it's a chaotic system, right? Since with initial conditions. So then, I mean, the, so what's the connection to Kolmogorov's omega and so on? So you can say, okay, we, we would like to maybe do parameter estimation for the system using the classical, <laughs> classical say Euler-Lagrangian family, right? So it has like six parameters, including gravity and so on. So it's all circuits. So then you can basically tell them that um, uh, 
yeah, you get the actual data, so you can do repeated trials, right? You don't have to release at the same place for repeated trials, as long as it's controlled somehow. And then, um, yeah, so you can have multiple trajectories and that's sort of the IID sample of the, the, the thing until it comes to rest. And then you can use those to do parameter estimation for say, the, the standard Euler-Lagrangian formulation of the double pendulum. And um, anyway, so that's, um, so yeah, this is kind of the raw data look like, looks like it's sort of lossless compression with these uh, integers. Um, is there anything else important here? Sorry, <laughs> thought there was some equations here. Um, maybe there's no equations. Um, sorry. Um, oh, I missed the page. <laughs> no, okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, maybe it's, so anyway, it's the standard, standard uh, difference equation. So now what I want to point out with this is that uh, this is, um, not a big deal, but what we really did with this experiment is that we wanted to construct something that uh, could challenge any human being who wants to come up with a more sophisticated version of the Lagrange. So what I mean by that is we wanted this to be a prelude to non-parametric estimation. So these the, the double pendulum is constructed so that we can put um, loads on this. Right. We can actually anchor other weights on this with, uh, with springs and bobs between the loads. So there was actually internal oscillations inside the cent for, for the center of the uh, mass of each arm. I have not met any, any, any human who can model that yet. Uh, and then we can also add magnets, the permanent magnets inside the bobs that are suspended on springs on each arm. And those magnets have very complicated dynamics as well. So then, uh, I mean, then people think it's crazy to model, right? So that's what we want on a very complex system, but it's easily measurable. So someone just, then the question is, what can you do in a non-parametric setting, right? Like what can you actually say about, uh, about this pendulum dynamics by assuming almost nothing about the parameterization set? So that's the, the link. The other thing I wanted to point out is, okay, what about mathematical art? So, um, I always spent a few months obsessed with Indian combinatorics, history of Indian combinatorics. So this is a, another sabbatical I did at the Chennai Mathematical Institute. Uh, they don't have cobras, <laughs> it's in the middle of the city, but they have good food. So this is actually a sculpture. Uh, and then it says Pare Purnamati. It's uh, written by Pingala 2000 years ago. And Pingala was interested in, uh, uh, in, in a very simple problem, which is, uh, how many ways can you say uh, uh, strings with two sounds, la and ga, right? So you can say la 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 la, say ga 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 ga, la ga la ga ga la ga la ga. So you can count, right? It's basically just binomial. And, and he did this for other reasons for, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, for, for, you know, for Sanskrit prosody reasons, right? So it's, it's a quite a cool, cool thing, except that at that time, um, these people, well, they, 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 they wrote theorems in poem format and it's a bit difficult to understand, but he's talking about some recursion in this poem. And then what we did is uh, took a big granite sculpture and made this hexagonal lattice. That's the prototype uh, for the 2D that Eric showed us. And so you basically have water coming in. So this granite sculpture is sort of tilted a little bit and then water comes in and splits in two and merges in back and forth. And then it collects in these hollow channels in the bottom, and then more water will flow through the middle channels. It's, it's the same thing, and it's on a pump, and so the sort of water keeps keeps streaming. This rock, I think, is uh, from the Chola dynasty when they were taming elephants to wage war with the with the North Indians. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's got a lot of history. We picked every piece of rock very carefully, and so on. And uh, if you're interested, there is this PDF you can dive into but I'm not sure if this will play. So of course, you know, it'll be really nice to build something like that, but Sweden may have to keep it indoors, things outside, but granite will work, you know. Um, so anyway, that's that one. Uh, and uh, 
you know, something else we kind of built, but <laughs> ran out of budget and is even the small pieces water wheel. This is sort of my other really favorite thing but I'd love to build at uh, some point. So once again, we can make a measurable version of this. So this is uh, essentially the, the, the first couple terms of the trigonometric expansion of this is uh, the Lorentz equations, right? So it basically has these cups mounted on a wheel and then there are tiny holes at the bottom of the cups. It's called the Frenchman's flow, something flow. And then so when the water drips, it, it sort of goes like, uh, it's a bit difficult to, I don't know if the simulation will work. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So you have this sort of fills and then, then it starts leaking after a while and then it becomes extremely uh, sensitive to initial conditions. Um, so I think I had a YouTube video. Um, and it's in uh, one of the books we use for complex systems, like Steve Strogat's book on nonlinear dynamics. Uh, there's a whole nice page to it and something that explains this and how the Lorentz equations come from it. This is a harder one to build. I don't know if <laughs> Eric's listening and he's up for the challenge, but what I would love to do is to put a mercury switch and an optical encoder in the middle of it. Uh, sorry about this. <laughs> Then you know. Then you actually have a measurable version, and we could have the streaming, right? Because the water can just be set through a pump, and then it could be like a signature of the department, or yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing we did with this is the uh, competition is, uh, you know, who has the most control of the of their Lyapunov constant game, right? So you get the idea. So we have these science fairs, so students can come and. You know, they have to release at least above a certain energy level. So they have to go say, we, we put some, some thing, they have to at least go this high. They can go higher, but, and then the question is, can they do two releases super carefully to see how long the both arms are, are you know, together, right? So that's like how they're, because it's all about how they release it, right? So the Kolmogorov's omega in this experiment is in the neuromusculature of the release, right? How much coffee you had, every, of course, everything shaking. So um, that was kind of a fun thing. So people really liked it and started challenging one another. Um, yeah, this one's really good. Jordi, maybe I'll send the video to Jordi. Uh, so this is another more interesting pendulum that can be used in engineering courses and so on. Right? This is the, um, to Bochinsky's pendulum. Okay, so now um, that's the end of part two. Part three, how are, how are people doing? This is the last part. So I thought we'll do like, a, I mean, of course these things take time and we have like four hours for every hour on the blackboard here, the budget for teaching. So we, we sort of spent some energy on, 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 on computer code because it's a lot easier. Um, so this is to illustrate uh, some laws and theorems, say probability and statistics using sort of real data. So I'll try and do a live demo. So you should be able to go here and, and it's open to at least Uppsala University. People, if you wanna play around and contribute, it's all on GitHub. So you can um, sort of go down and grab the starting package. So it'll download as a zip file. And then I've sort of already done this. So you can unzip this. Um, and that's what I've done here. And then I launched a, a, a Sage server instance locally. So all our students do this. So maybe I shouldn't launch another one. Yeah, so I have it running here. So this is basically the topics, right? So we sort of get all of them in the same page. So the engineers and the math students know as much bash and programming and, and maths, it's sort of the equalizing course. So I, I won't go through all of this. I thought I'll show you a few examples of maybe the convergence of limits of random variables and confidence sets, uh, maybe uh, mock-up chains, uh, maybe some, some other, let's see. So I like Sage Math a lot. I think Benny does too. So you can, you can choose kernel. So Sage Math includes most of the computational maths. Uh, um, software. So it sort of looks like this, so a markdown file, so you can do LaTeX and so on. 
uh, in place. And you can do like interactive visualizations, which is, is quite good. So this one is just showing some uh, Taylor approximation, say fourth order of e to the minus x sine of x. So, you can, so these are called at interacts, they're decorations on standard images. So you can quickly allow students to change a bunch of buttons. And, and so one of the quizzes we have is like, or um, bus. So number of seats in the bus and then people waiting. So they're supposed to reason about, I forgot what, something about how the queues behave and the arrival process and the capacity in the bus, like how long do you have to wait? And there's some, some simple quizzes that they can do. Um, here is the, the other sort of thing we sort of have been, I hope it works. So this actually is fetching data live from uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, and then showing you uh, a linear regression of the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Right? So it's nice to have these live fetches, and you know you can sort of play around, uh, and it sort of gives this sort of immediate real worldness, right? And then what we started doing is instead yeah, of problems, I did Wikipedia directly. So we, we just embed Wikipedia images and, and URLs. So the more mathematically students can dive in and then, you know, and, and others can kind of at least get some pictorial view. Um, let me give you something more complex. So this is notebook 10, this is the 11th notebook in the course. How do you explain convergence of limits of random variables to students who are very rusty about what limits mean when people just real numbers? Um, so anyway, this is sort of an attempt at this. Um, so we sort of introduce limits um, in sort of basic examples. And we have this uh, likelihood function for Bernoulli process, which is a zero one process. So there's some Bernoulli trials happening. And then we're looking at the, the sort of likelihood function, it's concentrated. So that sort of motivates why we need to consider limits of random variables and so on. Um, yeah, we give them all these functions that they don't need to know, but they have to evaluate because some students are very good at programming. So they appreciate it, but nothing is uh, black boxed. So here are some, some simple examples of running means and things like this. Why does a standard Cauchy running mean never settle down? So we think about L1, you know, or, you know, random variables whose expectation doesn't exist, can be made to be, will be a certain loss. And it's, it's, yeah, it's a simple um, hand holding like this. Um, yeah, point mass random variables, thinking of like a sequence of real numbers, a sequence of point mass random variables, and sort of building up slowly from there. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, and then they have these kinds of interacts that can play, okay, whatever variance increases or decreases, what happens to the Gaussian density? And here is sort of, yeah, it's a motivation. So um, I don't wanna go through too much, but the, maybe the punchline is this. So we can do various simulations here for different random variables and show that as the sample size increases, you have sort of, the, you know, different distributions, the data sample limit theorem, and, and also how do, you, how do you explain confidence intervals? So these are tractable. So this is simply a Bernoulli process, like uh, crossing a fat coin right now, but then looking at uh, these sort of confidence intervals and what proportion of them are actually in the confidence interval. So everything is animated by the so there's no, should be, I mean, at, at least for instances, there should be no difference between the formal formal theorem and the, and the interact animation. I mean, concepts can be. So even the STS students like that particular, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of this, because they, they're, they're good kids, you know, but their backgrounds are really off all over the place. So um, I think the last thing I'll quickly show is like, uh, you know, Markov chains and random structures. So you don't just have real value random variables, you have key value graph value or whatever value random variables. So you can quickly sort of introduce things. Here we just start with a two, two sample Markov chain, dry, wet chain, you know, dry or wet. But the nice thing is we go to Christchurch's weather station, we start grabbing from Gothenburg as well. 
uh, and then get actual rainfall data for the last several years and then convert that to a dry or wet. And then, so they actually get live data fetches and, uh, and do estimations of the two state market chain. Right? And in the end, you know, you have other more interesting things. So some things we don't expect them to do in the course, but then a lot of more keen students uh, like this. So those are like random walks and random graphs using SageMats. So we're just tapping into simple libraries that are there. So they can just do a very simple random walk, increase the number of steps, and that sort of gives you, also they can do a three-dimensional random walk. Um, you know, this is all JMOL animations, which is kind of nice. And some connections to Wiener processes, but these are all sort of touched upon, so they say they see this in other courses. And then here's uh, the, 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 the Sage map has a huge graph library under the hood, so we can sort of produce realizations of uh, this is a balance three, parameters two, five. Okay, so there's quite a lot of, um, yeah, quite a lot of random graphs here, right? So we can play around with stuff. That's it for now. Um, I hope we have some time for questions. So. school children to students sort of interact with us to see what we're doing and yeah. uh, you know I think this kind of hands-on things that would be great for to use for all those yeah yeah so, <clears throat> so somehow you should talk to Jordi because he yeah. had the, also the idea that you know I mean there's something sim similar he, he was happening in Barcelona when he was there yeah yeah, I mean, this is so I was uh, my admin role for several years in New Zealand was called the outreach coordinator. So yeah, we had these yearly math fairs or it's part of the whole university fair, right? So students will come to math and engineering departments. And so we had activities like cornstarch, you can punch the cornstarch or jump on it and they talk about non newtonian fluids. And yeah, that's, uh, yeah, because that's how we get bright students to do mathematics, otherwise they go to engineering. So yeah, we, we had these kinds of activities. Also even at primary school. So like, for example, yeah. But a lot of it was done through uh, our math clubs. So yeah, so they get like a tutor support. So if they go to their own high school for outreach, they will get like two hours of like tutorial time or something like this. So and that was the most effective strategy than faculty going. It was better if the best students from the school when to talk about, you know, stuff. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's a separate problem as well. Um, well, so there are certain activities already in place, sort of okay. organized on the university level where we okay. can participate. Right. And I think if we if we have such 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 things set yeah. up already, yeah, you know, it's just a matter of someone participating and bringing those. Yeah. Groups. And also this this thing that you mentioned, it's called stamp. Student ambassador here. Okay. Uh, you know we do. There. Oh, there they are, are okay. students going okay. to high school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, showing things. You know? Yeah. So with just some coaching, you can have the appropriate. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly how it works. So the students will take these things from the whatever the department. It's like a lending library, and then they will usually set up a station. So it depends on the school zone. So some schools will give them a booth during their graduation time or whatever. It's like a career fair, yeah, it's very similar. And then somebody goes and demonstrates, someone who knows the mathematics behind it goes and talks about it. And then usually there was some kind of a, some kind of a brochure of all the amazing alumni, what they're doing, like it's said something like this. Yeah. Are there any questions about uh, set chunks or is this, I mean? Yeah. yeah. 
well, I don't know, like the, the usual definition of a measurable, like, uh, yeah, you know, you have some, I don't know, some, some space here, some set, and I mean, this is like, yeah, so, you know, you have, you, know, you have some sigma algebra usually. As I did, okay, but then, yeah, uh, and then the inverse map solve exists here. Okay. And, but then how can you construct non measurable it... Yeah, that's good. Uh, it depends on the experiment. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, so this is, if, if you look at it from a probability theory point of view, which is what I saw. So, you know, you, 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 you can have uh, events with zero probability that um, happen, right? And then, um, well, you assign zero probability to it, but something actually happened. Right? Mm -hmm. So, like a concrete way of understanding this, this was actually an exercise. Uh, students were supposed to tell me from the two-dimensional clean chunks what's a, what's a zero probability event, right? Yeah. Because the idea that you have, I had the same idea, is that a zero probability event never happens. That's not actually true. A zero probability event happens all the time. It's just zero probability under the model, right? So then when you drop the ball in a weird way, it'll jump sometimes rarely and go get stuck in the top corner and they'll never come down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was actually one of the engineering students who told me, oh, is that a zero probability event? I was like, oh, I don't know, I guess. Yeah, and then we sat down and thought about it and had some other older electrical engineering people. Yeah, yeah, that is a zero probability event. What should you do? You should be aware of this. The model doesn't capture this. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and then you know, they just started going crazy. Or they wanted to put sensors in every nail and feel the vibrations, and they will know that's not as if, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Run out of budget quickly. <laughs> um, okay, so any other questions? Well, I suppose that if people need, people here need coaching to use kind of these kinds of things in their courses, they're welcome to come to the courses. Yeah, and yeah. You seem to be an expert. I don't know, expert, but yeah. I mean, I think it's uh, it's a good way to reach students. And I think the scaling approach, as I said, like, is it really good to print some things? But you know, then the people who do the tutorials have to get involved and, you know, it's it's complicated, right? Because every instructor will have their own style. And so it may be counterproductive as well. So some things are, you know, maybe not applicable. Well, yeah, I think, but I think there's often sort of a threshold when you start doing something that you actually don't feel comfortable comfortable with yeah. so it's good to sort of go and yeah. like in discussion about yeah. this or yeah and, it, and i mean it'll be really great if you can pay eric to get the set chunks <laughs> i mean for the department we, property i can buy it and keep it at home yeah, that's but, one thing but just generally yeah. using say yeah. uh, yeah, no no resources yeah yeah that's true but yeah. benny is very good with yeah, uh, well, your, there's two of yes them. right so we and then we've developed the materials it's openly as about. well so anyone can contribute and, and yeah. fork and yeah it's free it's open for everybody you just download it now you can edit it and do whatever you want to do. You can even put your own name on yeah. it as the authors. It's very, very open. <laughs> I mean, some students really like it. Uh, and they actually just sort of feedback on that. Mm. And others, they hate it. Uh, but then they have other reasons to start. So you can give them something as well. Yeah, yeah so I mean, the group assignments are proving theorems. So yeah. pencil paper, right? So it's very bifurcated. I mean, of course, it's, it's a sort of non-trivial non question to, 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 to decide, I mean, what do you actually, um, what do you learn? How does it contribute to, to learning? Yeah. And what, in what sense? But it's certainly con building con conceptual understanding. Yeah. Some, some to do. We should uh, start survey questions in the end of the course, right? So we actually see what the students think. You can also do one almost now. It's mid. It's basically mid. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thank you very um, much. And Eric. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>